Hey guys, welcome to the Outpouring Orlando's YouTube channel, where we exist to help people grow in Christ, share the gospel, and serve the community. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by today's message. Hey, if you're ever in the Orlando area, we would love to serve and worship with you. I hope to see you soon. John chapter 4, verses 27 through 42. When you got it in your Bible, say amen to me. All right. Uh, it says, says this. John chapter 4, verses 27 through 42 says this. Just then, his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking, why are you talking to her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into the town, and told the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, you got to eat something. But he said, I I have food to eat that you don't know about. And the disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus told them, don't you say that there are still four months and then the harvest comes? And here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready For harvest, the the reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the reaper and the sower, the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. In this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. And here's what he says in verse 38. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for and others have labored for and you have benefited from their labor. Now, many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Because of what he said to the because of what the woman said when he testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of what he said, and they told the woman, "We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world." Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning, God, for your goodness, God. We thank you that we are here this first Sunday in 2022. God, we just want to say thank you for just for your mercy in our lives, God, that we are still here to give you praise, to give you honor, and to give you glory. And so, Father, my prayer this morning is that the word would set us, would set a pace for us, God, that we would be able to go back throughout the year, God, and and come back to this, come back to this same theme and remember, God, that you are a God that fills us and gives us everything that we need. My prayer today, Father, is that, that for the rest of the year, God, that we would be a people who are committed to your work, who are committed to our relationship with you, and God, I pray that we would, we would bear fruit in our relationship with the Lord this year, God. Let, let the gospel be real to us this year, Father. And so, Father, we open ourselves to be transformed, to be renewed, to grow in you this year. And so, Father, we thank you. We pray that your son Jesus today would be lifted up. We pray that he would be made known today through the preaching of the word of God. And so, Father, let us not just sit back and, and be spectators, God, but let us participate in what you have to say to us on this morning. And so, Father, we pray ultimately that your will would be done in our lives. And we thank you for this opportunity, God, to study your word together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My sermon title this morning is kind of long, but I think it bears saying, my sermon title is God's Antidote to Our Burnout. God's Antidote to Our burnout. My subtitle is long too. Bear with me. Uh, Couldn't come up with anything shorter. Prioritizing the will and the work of God. God's antidote to our burnout. Subtitle, prioritizing the will and the work of God. 
I want to start off by talking and, and leveling with you about what we've all had to deal with and what we seemingly still have to deal with going on two years now. Th- this, this worldwide global pandemic that we've been dealing with, just, just when you thought you didn't have to talk about it anymore, it says, hold my beer. And, and so I, I think that it, we, I don't want to negate or, or take away from or diminish the impact that this may have had on our, on our souls. A recent New York Times article entitled, Worry Burnout is Real, talks about the implications of having to deal with all that we've gone through in these last couple of years. W- worry Burnout is Real, I thought was a very fitting title, and I appreciate the title because the title is honest. It, it is not negating for us that, that, that what we're feeling and experiencing of being fatigued and burnt out is something that we just imagine on our own. It actually levels with us and tells us that worry, burnout is actually a real thing. In the article, Thea Gallagher, who's a professor and a clinical psychologist at NYU, said this, when you're dealing with long and unending uncertainty and trauma, there's only so much you can handle. That There's only so much you can handle. She goes on to say, in the aftermath of natural and man-made disasters, acute stress oftentimes leads to exhaustion and hopelessness over time. Anybody in these last two years ever felt a little bit of exhaustion? Have you felt tired at some point, like I'm, I'm over it already? Well, well this, this article gives credence to that. It, it talks about this, and so it names some of the types of fatigues and burnouts, some that I was not even familiar with. Some, some are some of us deal with what's called worry burnout. Some of us have had to deal with parental burnout, meaning that you work a job, but because of the pandemic, you were at home with your kids more than you ever had to be. Some of us have had to deal with p- pandemic fatigue, just, just tired of all of the things that keep coming up. Some of us have had issue fatigue. And then there's career burnout. We're right in the midst of what's called being called the great resignation, where people are leaving their jobs to pursue other career opportunities. They've taken this time to say, you know what, since this is going on, let me take a shot and change my career or go do something different or go find something else fulfilling. But that also leads to career burnout. Also, some of us who are in church and have been here throughout the pandemic and we're going to church online and we're serving through all of that. Some of us are dealing even with spiritual burnout. So there's all kinds of burnout. And I think there's one that's not listed that was there that I thought about that if you've been home for a long time, you've dealt with eating burnout and your scale would bear proof that you've dealt with eating burnout. And, And one of the signs that this article goes on to state that is a sign of burnout is that you are tired all the time. You ever take a nap and then 10 minutes later you're tired again? And it talks about this. And it says after an intense period of anxiety, people often feel depressed and depleted. Whether, whether the source of the worry is a global disaster or the day-to-day stress over work and family, anxiety causes us to constantly scan for threats until we reach a point of exhaustion. Worry, burnout is real. But, but what I found most interesting in the article was that there was a doctor who serves at the University of Michigan in the Family Depression Center. He said this, and I thought this was very interesting. In the first two months of the coronavirus pandemic, he personally observed, hear this, an unexpected significant drop in depression among healthcare workers. Let let me say that again in case that didn't register for you. I didn't say an increase, I said a drop. He said that he personally observed an unexpected significant drop in depression among healthcare workers, which he attributed to them having a sense of community and purpose. And so it's amazing that he came to the understanding that when people had a purpose and when they had community, somehow it was able to combat the fatigue that they were dealing with. However, he goes on to say that they became anguished and fatigued, though, over time as the pandemic dragged on, as they wrestled with a level of vigilance and concern that was sustainable for two weeks or two months, but it definitely wasn't sustainable for two years. And so... Today, I want to talk about God's antidote for our burnout. 
I think it's interesting that the observation in this article was that that when there was a sense of community and purpose among healthcare workers, that there was a drop in depression. There is something to be said when a person has community, and there is something to be said when a, purpose, a person feels like they have a purpose, when a person feels like there is something for them to do, when there is something for them to rally around, when there is something that is beyond themselves that they can be a part of, and this is what the gospel offers us. And I think we can find this in no place more strange than a story about the woman at the well. When you think about fatigue and you think about God's antidote to our burnout, the last place I would think to look would be in this story about the woman at the well. And if you're unfamiliar with this story, Jesus, after doing ministry, is headed to Galilee and Jesus has to go through a place called Samaria. And in Samaria, he meets this woman at this well. And let me give you a little background so you can understand. Samaria was a region between Judea and Galilee. Jesus was doing ministry in in Judea, but he had to travel to Galilee. He was going to leave there and go to Galilee. The problem is the short route from Judea to Galilee went straight through Samaria. And the problem is most of the times Jews didn't go that route. They went the longer route to avoid having to go through Samaria. And here's why. The Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. There was a great disdain between Jews and the Samaritans. Samaria was actually a city located in the northern kingdom of Israel. There was a point in time in history where Israel was united, and then at a point they became split, and there was a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah, and so the kingdom split, and in the northern kingdom, the capital city was a place called Samaria, but there came a time when this group of people, follow along with me here, called the Assyrians came in, and they took over the northern kingdom. What they did was they came in, they took over, they took some of the Jews, the upstanding, well-to-do Jews, the high-class Jews, they took them and deported them to Assyria, and they left all of the low-class Jews there. And so what happened was once they did that, the Assyrians then, once they took over some other territories, they took the other foreigners, brought them also to Samaria, and they made them live together with the Jews that were left behind. So what happens when the people are in the land together? The Jews who were left and those who came from foreign countries that the Assyrians brought in, they intermarried and started having families. And so once they started having families, they created their own community, and these people were birthed called the Samaritan, who were mixed Jews. And so what happened was the people who were held in exile, who had been taken away from their homeland, the Jews who were not mixed, the Jews who were deported, those Jews now looked at the mixed Jews who were left in Samaria. They kind of looked at them side eye, and there was this, this disconnect, this disdain, this hatred between those who were pure Jews and the Samaritans who were mixed Jews. And so they did not deal with one another. They had no relationship with one another. They could not stand one another. And so they did everything that they could to avoid each other. And the Bible tells us Jesus had to go through Samaria. That's interesting because Jesus is a Jewish man. And if Jesus is a Jew, why is he not doing what the other Jews are doing and avoiding Samaria and going around the long way to avoid the Samaritans? But Jesus, it says that he had to go through Samaria. And that is interesting because when it says he had to go through, it almost speaks of this divine, sovereign thing that had to happen. And the thing that had to happen was that Jesus was there on assignment to meet a Samaritan woman. And this will be the first example that we see of Jesus. Jesus having a cross-cultural ministry. We see cross-cultural evangelism between Jesus and the woman at the well. And so Jesus, a Jewish man, is dialoguing with the Samaritan. But he's not just dialoguing with the Samaritan. He's dialoguing with the Samaritan woman. And here's why this is important. He's dialoguing with the Samaritan. He's dialoguing with the Samaritan woman. And he's dialoguing with a Samaritan woman who has a sordid past. She has a horrible reputation. 
that this is not someone that you want to talk to. And we see Jesus breaking with social norms to talk to and engage with somebody that no one else was willing to talk to. That that should be a lesson for us that we shouldn't look down on anybody. That if Jesus was willing to talk to an outcast or somebody that no one else was willing to deal with, then we should too. If we have what they need, then we have a responsibility as believers to share that good news with someone no matter what they look like. But sometimes we are more comfortable only having relationships with people that look like us when Jesus has called us to have a ministry that go that goes past the bounds that we grew up with that we came from and say hey if you see somebody who does not look like you who did not grow up like you who doesn't have the same skin color as you who doesn't have the same money as you you still have a responsibility as a believer to share the good news with them because we are all equal at the foot of the cross And so we see Jesus dialoguing with this woman who is a moral outcast in every sense of the word. She is a woman that has made a mess out of her life. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. He could lose his reputation if he's caught in public speaking to this woman. And you have to ask the question, why would Jesus be willing to risk his reputation to talk to this woman? Because he cared about her soul. He cared about her soul. Jesus didn't just see this woman as a Samaritan. He saw her as an image bearer. And for us, when we encounter people, we're not just encountering people. We're encountering image bearers. And maybe somebody has a different lifestyle than you. Maybe somebody thinks differently from you. Maybe someone doesn't like what you like. Maybe you guys stand in staunch opposition politically, spiritually, or whatever the case may be. But it does not matter because that person is an image bearer. And that is how we as believers are called to see people who are not like us or see people who are far away from God. And Jesus is talking to this woman because he cares more about her soul than social stigmas. And so Jesus is at this well talking to this woman and he's talking to her because she's there drawing water. She's there in the middle of the day at at, at noon and she's trying to make sure she's not seen while she's out there in the middle of the day. And Jesus says, hey. Um, I got a different kind of water than the water that you're drawing. I, I want to offer you something different. Jesus offers her not just the type of water she came to draw, but he offers her water that she does not understand that she desperately needs. If we go back in the story and we didn't read these verses, but Jesus at one point says to the woman, follow along with me. If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Later on, Jesus tells the lady, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. He's talking about the water in the well, but everyone who drinks from the water that I give them will never be thirsty again. In fact, the water that I give him will become a wellspring, springing up for him eternal life. And so we must understand when Jesus is talking about this water, he's making an analogy. We must understand that fresh water in those days, in that culture, in that society was valuable. People needed water. There was a scarcity of water. People did not have water back then. And so water was so important especially in a land that's dry, that's hot, that's arid like, a, that, like the Middle East. And so Jesus is essentially saying, yes, you can't survive without this water because it's essential, but the water that I'm giving you, no, you really can't survive without this water. And here it is, a free gift of living water that is going to last you more than the water that you're going to draw out of this well. This is what Jesus is offering her, and he tells her, hey, you might draw this water, but at some point you're going to have to come back and get some more of this. But the water I give you, you'll never go thirsty. You'll, you'll, ne- you, you'll never be thirsty. And the woman said, sir, give me this water so I don't have to come back out here and get any more water. And the reason she's saying this is not because it's hot outside and she don't want to come out in the heat and get water. This woman is drawing water at this time of the day because she has a shameful past. This woman has a shameful past. She's done some things and she's doing some things that she's ashamed of. It's noon. The Bible tells us in the story that it's noon. That might not mean anything to you, but in that culture, women didn't come out that early in the day to draw water. Women typically came out during 3 or four, three o'clock, 4 o'clock when the temperature was cooler. But this woman is so ashamed of her past, so ashamed of the things that she's done, she comes earlier to avoid having contact with other women because she knows that other women know her reputation. And so she's here because she's shame. She, she's, she's guilty with, of, of what she's done. She's trying to avoid other people because her, 
her reputation is shot. And here Jesus is talking to the woman. And Jesus has with her what I call a necessary confrontation. Jesus doesn't skate around her issue, but Jesus speaks right to it. Jesus says this to the woman, and it's so cold, I cringe every time I read it. Jesus asks the woman, he tells the woman, go get your husband. And the lady says, um, I don't have a husband. And he says, you speak, you spoken truthfully. You're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. I was like, oh my God. I was like, Jesus, Jesus, like that's a, oh my, God. like, can you, can you lay off a little bit? And, but he speaks right into it, but he's speaking into it, not to shame her, not to condemn her, but he wants her to see her sin so she can see her need for what he has to offer her because this is going to lead to her destruction. But what he has to offer her is going to lead to life. And so first of all, before you get the good news, you got to know the bad news. And he points out to her, yes, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're with now, he's not even your husband, but I still want to offer you living water. I need you to see your sin first so that I can give you the antidote and the remedy, which is forgiveness. And this is what's happening in the text. And Jesus is talking to this woman. He, he's trying to give her what she truly needs, but she thinks she needs something else. All the things that she's been filling her life with up to this point have never brought her fullness or satisfaction that she so desperately desires. The things she has attempted to satisfy her life with have only satisfied her for a short while. She sought to bring satisfaction through multiple marriages and relationships, but each one seems to satisfy her temporarily, and it leaves her more desperate than she was before. But I don't think we should pick at this lady or look down on her because maybe you don't have five husbands. But maybe there's something else that you keep going back to that you think is going to fill you that's never been intended to fill you. And what you don't know is, is that that thing, although it feels like it might bring, bring you pleasure in the moment, it only makes you more fatigued. It can't fill the desire. And this is what this woman is seeking after, but Jesus is offering her something that will always be available, that will always satisfy her in ways that this water that she's trying to draw cannot, in ways that the futile, vain attempts to find fulfillment outside of God cannot. This water that Jesus offers her will give her eternal life, and this is the crux of the text today, that God has offered us a greater, deeper nourishment to our souls than that which we keep reaching for. God has offered us something that only God can provide, and with where we are today with more disappointment and bad news than we can handle we have a tendency to try to make all of these moves and do all these things and add on this other stuff in the name of making changes and being better most of it being done to fill a longing that you think is external but really it's an internal longing and we think it's our resume and our reputation that needs to be strengthened when really it's our souls really it's our souls all of the acceptance we need and the identity that we try to get from other places can only be found in one place. And so I want to read to you where Jesus gets this idea of water and thirst from. And he, speak, he looks back to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 2 where God extends an invitation to Israel. And here's what he says. And here's what this pastor is saying to us. Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. You ain't got to pay for friends. You ain't got to pay for people to like you. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choices of foods. God extends an invitation for him to give us everything that we are seeking out in the world. It's an invitation to be satisfied with things that money can't buy. Remember what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What? For they will be what? Filled. 
God is the only thing that can fill us. He's the only thing that can satisfy our longings. This is an invitation to complete satisfaction in God. And he's extending this invitation to not just somebody, not just another Jew. He's extending this invitation to a Samaritan woman, meaning that this is a worldwide invitation to receive the free gift of eternal life, regardless of your background, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of your race or anything that you've been to. The invitation is to whoever will come. This is what will fill us. The good news of salvation is available to every kind of person. And the woman at the well represents one of many kinds of people that God has sent his son to save. Here's what I need you to know. That we encounter people every single day who don't have answers. We encounter people every single day that don't have hope. And God has given us this hope, and God has given us this satisfaction that that can be found in him. And and we have a responsibility to share this with those that we see that are in need. There are many people that we walk by day to day, and we go about our business never giving a thought that these are people that God have created and made in his image and in his likeness, and he's called us, his redeemed, to share the good news of the gospel with them. There are so many people that are looking for answers, and we know who the answer is, and the answer is Jesus. But we keep it to ourselves. And so this is an invitation, number one, for us to be filled, and secondly, for us to extend the invitation that we've been extended. I I love what happens in verses 27 through 30. While Jesus is talking with this woman, the disciples come, and they arrive on the scene, and they're amazed that Jesus is talking to this woman, yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with this woman? Verse 28 tells us, then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, come, come. See a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they left town and made their way to him, talking about the people that she went and told. But this woman's response to her encounter with Jesus, I personally believe, is an amazing encounter. The disciples come. The disciples come, right? And so the lady leaves. And, and many theologians debate about this water jar. Because a woman came to the well with the water jar. She, how else was she going to take her water back home? She came with a water jar. She came with a water jar. This was before Dasani. This was before Zephyr Hills. This was before all of this. This this woman came with with a jar to be filled with water. But all of a sudden, after her encounter with Jesus, she leaves what she came with. And some believe that maybe she just in haste forgot and she was going to come back and get her water jar. But I think symbolically the water jar, in my opinion, in my estimation from my studies, I believe she left that water jar because when she left Jesus, she forgot what she came with. She left the past behind. She left what used to fill her behind when she met Jesus because an encounter with Jesus changes everything. The things that you thought you used to need, you no longer need because you have everything in him. She left her water jar and went and shared the gospel with everybody. That's amazing. Here's why. Because this woman who was now shamed goes out in public to tell the people she was trying to avoid about Jesus. What does that mean? He removed all of her guilt and her shame. A woman who had a sordid past, who made some bad mistakes and some bad decisions, now act like it never happened. Because therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you encounter Jesus, your past can't hold you. When you encounter Jesus, the sins of your past can't hold you down. Why are you ashamed of them when Jesus took on your shame and your guilt on the cross? If you are in him, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Live your life. Share the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. So what if they hold your past to you? Jesus doesn't. He's taken it away. He took it on the cross. You have nothing to worry about. Be who God called you to be. If people don't want to hear it, that's their problem, not yours. But you have a responsibility as somebody who has been set free to be used by God to do exactly what he called you to do. This is beautiful. This woman left her water jar. She left it. She ran off and told the same people she was trying to avoid. And some of us are afraid to go back and tell the people that we used to hang out about Jesus because we think that they remember us from, their, from our past. There are many people that we used to hang out with 
Okay, y'all acting, acting bougie. Sorry for all my visitors and guests. Some of these people that y'all used to go to the club with, some of the people that you used to smoke with, some of the people that you used to drink with, emphasis on used to, that you used to drink with, all right, now that you've been redeemed, you still act like you're bound. But Jesus has removed the past away. He's made all things new, including you. And this woman does not care what people think about her. She doesn't care. She just says, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. And suddenly, a woman who was ashamed becomes an evangelist. This woman is suddenly burdened about the souls of other people. She gets saved and she starts running immediately. Like she leaves her, her, there's a sense of urgency and eagerness in this lady to go and share this good news that she had. And, and I think it's this, is that if you have been genuinely saved by Jesus, there's something that happens on the inside of you that you can't just keep it to yourself. You, just, you have to tell. When, you, when he's really changed you and transformed you, you, you have to tell somebody. If you can tell somebody where you found a deal, if you can tell somebody where you got your hair done, if you can tell somebody about where you got your car from, if you can tell somebody where you bought your clothes from, how can you not tell them about somebody who changed your whole life? It is a byproduct of our salvation in Christ. Some, some people say, well, well, I don't know enough. You know, I've been saved that long, so I don't really know what to tell people. And I want to say this about this lady. She wasn't hindered by what she didn't know. She witnessed to what she did know. And what she did know was that the gospel had set her free. That I was a sinner, but I met a man who has made me clean and given me a new life. You don't need a degree from a school of theology to share the good news of the gospel. And I'm telling you, yeah, yes, get a seminary degree if you've been called to do that, and that's beautiful and that's wonderful. I, I am a student myself. I believe in education more than anybody. But, but if you are a believer in Jesus, you don't need to go to seminary to share the gospel. This is not just for the professional Christians, and then there's you. No, if you've been saved, you have a responsibility to share. I love what John Calvin says. He says, the knowledge of God cannot lie buried and inactive in our hearts and not be made known to men. We must tell somebody. And all of a sudden, this woman has a new love that she didn't have before. No longer did she have a selfish love that only sought to meet her own needs. Not just a love for Jesus now, but she has a love for Jesus and for other people. How can we describe this new transformed life in a few short words? I think Jesus described it well in Matthew's gospel. Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And so we love Jesus. We also love people. He is the only one that can cause us to overflow with love for other people. He is the only one who can take the weary, the tired, the exhausted, the fatigued, and cause them to live a life of pouring out love to others. He is the only one that can sustain and satisfy the tired, the exhausted, and the weary soul. This is found in Jesus. So maybe you've been tired. Maybe you feel like, man, I got a lot going on. Maybe you feel like you run down. Maybe you feel like you are over it. Maybe you're tired of variants and viruses and all of this other stuff. And I don't blame you. I'm right there with you Monday through Saturday. Don't be fooled because I preach sermons. I, I, I have the same complaints that you do. I complain as just as much as you do. But I do know this, that even if we're tired, will we see fatigue and tiredness, God sees an opportunity because there's a harvest out there of people who need the hope that we have. The interesting thing is that this story of the woman at the well happens while Jesus is traveling from one place to another. And guess who's experiencing burnout in the text? Guess who's tired? Jesus is. Because if we look back at verse 6, you know what it says about Jesus? Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. Jesus, worn out. Jesus, burnt out. Jesus, tired 
from his journey, sat down at the well. Jesus is physically exhausted. Je- Je- Some of us think Jesus is like Casper, the friendly ghost. Some of us think that Jesus goes through walls and houses and just shrouds in the air. But Jesus in, in his humanity is tired. He is a real man that has to do real traveling. He travels two hours to go where he is now, and he takes a seat at the well. Jesus is tired from doing ministry, from working. It is the hottest point of the day. It's noon. It's 100 degrees outside. He's thirsty. He's hungry. He's tired. Jesus is burnt out. He sits to relax and get some rest. He just so happens to sit at the well where the woman was coming because that's the sovereignty of God at work. But Jesus in his humanity, he is tired. And so his disciples do what friends do. They go and get their friends something to drink and something to eat. And Jesus asked the woman at the well for a drink, not because he was trying to be slick, but Jesus is actually asking this woman for a drink at the well because he's thirsty. But Jesus has a real need to rest in this instant. He's really tired. And the disciples return while he's talking to the woman, and they interrupt the conversation, and it says that they're amazed, but they're not amazed because Jesus is an awesome guy doing what an awesome guy does. No, they're amazed that Jesus is talking to this woman when he has no business talking to this woman. But the disciples are smart. They don't confront Jesus about it. They just let him be. The woman leaves, and then the disciples talk to Jesus. And they tell him, Rabbi, you need to eat something. And Jesus says, I got food you don't know about. Like, Rabbi, we, we, went up to, um, we went up to first watch, caught brunch. We got you a healthy breakfast, so you need to eat something. And Jesus says, I have food you'll know about. And the disciples, but doing what the disciples do in verse 33, look at what the disciples say. Could somebody have brought him something to eat? Could, could somebody have brought Jesus something to eat? Because dude talking about you're not hungry. When we left him, he was sitting down at the well, and he was tired, and he was exhausted, and he needed to rest, and he said he was worn out, but we come back, and we get, him food, get food for him, and he says, I have food that you don't know about, and then they ask each other, did somebody else bring him something to eat? And I imagine one of them was like, you know, he always on that Grubhub app. He probably, probably was looking to see if they added some new restaurants. And when we went, he probably ordered him something to eat. And the donkey came and probably bought him something to eat. Or the other disciple was like, nah, you know how Jesus is. He used DoorDash. You know he used DoorDash. He, he didn't care about his food being cold or, or them getting his order wrong because you know that's what happens when you use DoorDash. He didn't care about that. And then one of the other disciples was like, nah, you know Jesus. He likes to have all them excessive fees and paying all them delivery fees. So you know he used Uber Eats. You know he used Uber Eats. And they're having this conversation with Jesus, use Grubhub, did he do DoorDash, or did he use Uber Eats? And Jesus says, no, neither. My food was to do the will and the work of my Father. I got filled by doing the priorities of the kingdom first. I got replenished by doing some work. And oftentimes in the Bible, physical functions parallel spiritual functions. And Jesus is implying to them, I already ate. I'm full. I'm replenished. My soul has been restored. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Jesus is not saying he doesn't enjoy food or he doesn't enjoy a meal. But he's saying doing the will of the Father is just like eating to me. And so what he's saying to us is his spiritual took precedence over his physical. Doing Doing the will of God and finishing the work that he was sent to do was just like eating to his soul. Can I suggest to you this morning that maybe you are fatigued because you haven't prioritized doing the will and the work of the Father? Somehow, in, the, in God's economy, in God's kingdom, we see doing the work and the will of the Father replenishing to a man's soul. A man who was hungry, who was thirsty, who was tired, who needed something to eat. Somehow he found fulfillment and sustenance in doing the will of his father. So maybe it's not that you work too much. Maybe you haven't done the right work first. And so this speaks to us, and Jesus is pointing out to them, hey, your priorities are off. Your priorities should be do the work of the kingdom first. This is where you find life. This is where you find fulfillment. This is where you are satisfied. This is the antidote to burnout, to do the will of the Father first. And so Jesus is one who thought that doing the will of his Father filled him up. When we think about Jesus' ministry, we think about when he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God to be tempted by Satan. You can find that story in Matthew chapter 4. 
and, and Jesus is speaking to Satan. And one of the things that Jesus quotes is he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8. And here's what Deuteronomy chapter 8 says, because Jesus is using an illustration from when God spoke to Israel. Here's what he said. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Doing the will of the Father was like food to Jesus. And maybe God is humbling us to teach us that he is all we need. That he must be our preference and our priority. The antidote to his physical fatigue was to do spiritual work. You, you, you ever have so much enjoyment and fulfillment doing something that you lose track of time? You ever was doing something and the time just flew by real fast? It's like, whoa, man, where did the time go? I was having so much fun. Here's how you really know that you're engaged in something and enjoying and having fun. You ever were do, doing something, it was so good to you, you forgot to use the bathroom? You ever look up and you realize it's five hours later and you haven't you had to use the bathroom or hadn't had a sensation to use the bathroom? But, but, but parallel that for when you had to go to class or were in school at some point and you didn't want to be there, you, can you imagine how your bladder all of a sudden turns to a bladder of a 90-year-old person? You all of a sudden, as soon as you sit down, you have to use the bathroom. You have the itch, things go wrong, you get a headache, everything, you're hungry, your stomach is growling, you're looking up at the clock, it's only 10.30, you know lunch is at noon, you can't seem to wait another hour and a half. This is because you're doing something that you don't find fulfillment in. But when you find purpose and fulfillment in God, it's like you're eating. It, it fills up your soul. There's nothing more beautiful as a pastor, as somebody who's been in ministry for years, than to see somebody say, one, sa one saved soul makes up for all the heartache that I had to deal with years, years prior. Uh, one, one saved soul just fills my soul up. Doing the work of the Father is just like eating. When you're doing something and serving God and doing His will, it is just like eating and drinking. But those are things that we must discipline ourselves to do in love. Jesus is tired, but his sense of mission makes him come alive. It gave him what food could not give him. Now I want to say this to you guys. I'm all for doing extra stuff, getting an extra degree, changing jobs, getting a better paying job. I don't have anything against those things. I, I think we, we all should work to better, ourse better ourselves. I think that, that falls under stewardship. We've all been given this life to maximize it to the best of our ability for the glory of God. And so if God has given you a life, he's given you intelligence, he's given you time, he's given you gifts, he's given you resources, we are supposed to leverage those resources for the kingdom of God. I have no problem with a Christian who has resources. I have no problem with a Christ Christian who has means. I don't think Christianity is a religion for poor people or middle class people or any kind of person. And so I'm not one of those preachers that if you're rich and you're wealthy and that happens to you, praise the Lord, um, I, I don't think that you should be condemned for that. Because if God puts you in that position, God expects you to leverage it for the kingdom of God, not buy a Lamborghini first. Y'all all right? Okay. And so I have no problem, I have no problem with that. But if that is your primary pursuit, you've put the cart before the horse. Hear me, do you realize that the more self-centered you are, the more unhappy and unfulfilled you'll be? The tired and the burnout, the more, the more tired and the more burnout you are, often comes from us doing stuff just to satisfy ourselves. You will always be unfulfilled when your primary priority is you. Whenever you focus on you and only you, the result is burnout and being tired and, and being unfulfilled. If you focus on you, you will always have issues. If you focus on you, it will always be something else for you to accomplish and something else for you to do. But somehow, when we take our gaze and t take it from being inward and look out and see who else we can serve and what we can do for other people and how we can serve the Lord and expand his kingdom and do his work, all of a sudden we feel filled and fulfilled and we come alive because doing the will and the work of the Father is like food to our souls. What I'm trying to say for us today is that if you experience what we've all experienced throughout these last almost two years and we've dealt with all of this acute stress 
What I'm saying to you is this, that the antidote to burnout is not, is not automatically to do less. Sometimes it's do more, but do more for the kingdom of God. There's nothing, I, I can't think of a better thing than to see somebody else growing in Christ and to not take credit for it, but to know that I helped in that. To see some other people growing in their faith. When that young lady sent me that thing the other day that showed me she got finished with her Bible reading plan, I said, man, I should let her preach on Sunday. <laughs> not really. She's not, not she's she like, Pastor said, I'm not coming to church anymore. Um, but, but man, there should be something that makes you come alive outside of things being done for you. But Jesus says, my food is to do the will and the work of him who sent me. And if Jesus was sent, guess what? So are we. We've been sent as well. Here's what it says in John 17, 18. As you sent me into the world, I've also also have sent them into the world Jesus has sent us to work on his behalf and so this sets an agenda for how we can combat the mental emotional and spiritual fatigue that we all face if we're going to be tired let us be tired to the glory of God if we're going to be burnt out at least let it count in eternity and so there's a a political figure who, who passed in the last couple of years, a gentleman by the name of John Lewis. John Lewis was a civil rights advocate. He marched with Dr. King, worked with Dr. King in the 60s. And he lived into recent years, and he had this phrase that he talked about, about um, um, speaking out and standing up for, 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 for justice, for social justice, but he called it good trouble, right? Good trouble. He's saying that not all trouble is bad. Some trouble is worth it, right? Good trouble, right? But, but here's what I want to... Uh, propose to you today, maybe not good trouble, but maybe good tired. Maybe there's a good tired. Maybe there's a good tired that we can get into. Maybe there's a good burnout. Maybe there's a healthy burnout. Maybe there's a burnout that lasts for eternity. Maybe there's a burnout that we get rewarded for in heaven, and this is what the gospel presents us an opportunity to do. There is plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of, of people, a, a harvest of souls that are waiting for people like you and I to go out and share the good news of the gospel. Here's what it says in verses 35 through 38. And Jesus talking to his disciples, don't you say there's still four more months and then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. And what Jesus is saying is that there's no need to wait. That there's no time like the present. That maybe we've been filling our calendar up with things that we want to do and things that we want to accomplish. And that's all good and well but it shouldn't take precedence over the priorities of the kingdom of God. And for all of those that say, yes, I'll do the Lord's work when I'm not busy with my own stuff. I'll get to it when, I have, when I've established myself. When, when I finish this one thing that I'm working on, I'll be open to whatever the Lord wants to do in my life. When, once I make a name for myself here, th then I'll do whatever the Lord wills. And Jesus says, open your eyes and look at the fields. The time is now. Like there is no time like the present. And I imagine that Jesus is looking at this Samaritan woman who's gone back to share this good news with the people in her own community. And I'm done. I want to say this. There's a theologian by the name of Leon Marvis. He wrote this about this particular passage. He said, past is not some insignificant one where it does not matter much whether or not it is done Jesus is talking about work in a field where the eternal welfare of people is at stake. Like this isn't just about us doing some church work or just serving the Lord haphazardly, but this is about eternity. This is about eternity. This is not about being a professional Christian and doing professional Christian work. No, this is about 
right here, right now, where we are, doing the work of ministry in the name of the Father, seeing people saved in the name of Jesus, telling people about the good news of Jesus, that he has come to die for sinners, that there's forgiveness found in him, that there's eternal life found in him, that there's joy, there's peace, there's love that is found in Jesus. This is our responsibility to share with a lost and dying world. I knew we were in trouble when, when, when Betty White died on the last day of the year. I said, Lord, have mercy. We, we got to do something. This is, we are in trouble. If they took the last golden girl, I don't know what's next. This is too much. If they took Betty Wright, if Betty Wright is going on the last day of the year, I don't know what, this is a sign. I'm not trying to be charismatic. That means something. But we have an opportunity, in all seriousness, to share the good news of the gospel. And here's what I want to say. It's not a nuisance. It's not a nuisance to some other important things that you have going on. Yes, money is cool. Name recognition is cool. Networking and brotherhood and sisterhood is nice. That's cool, but it's not eternal. Those things are not eternal. The only rewards we get in heaven will come from the work that we did in his name. So when we look at the sowing that we've been called to do, it is difficult at times. Ask anybody who's served in ministry or served in church, served in this church, if you've done it for longer than five minutes, you have the temptation to want to back away from it. But there's an interesting passage in the Psalms. Psalm 126 and 5 through 6 says this. Those who sow in tears will reap shouts of joy. Though one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed, he will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. There's not one, it's not one tear that you've sown in the name of the Lord that he won't replace with unspeakable, immeasurable joy in eternity. I want to challenge you to lift your eyes past the temporal and fix your gaze on eternity. I'll do it when I get old. How do you know you're not old today? Because if you're not here at 30, if it be the Lord's will and you're not here at 30 and you're 27 today, guess what? You're pretty old. God gives us these opportunities to serve him. But Satan comes in to distract us and tells us, no, take those resources, take those gifts, take that ambition and use it for yourself. Build your own little kingdom. But what he doesn't tell you is it's fool's gold. Like an old preacher that I sat under used to say, only what you do for Christ is going to last. That's real. And so this year, let's make this thing count. While everybody is complaining, if you're going to be tired, you might as well be good tired. If you're going to be fatigued, if you, you can't get enough of CNN and Fox News and MSNBC or whatever your persuasion is, how about first the good news of the gospel? And this is an invitation for us. And God has provided a way for us. And God has provided an antidote to our burnout by doing the will and the work of the Father. And he calls all of us to do it. So I'll close and say this. The interesting thing in this, in the interesting thing in this story, at the end, you le- read the last four verses, is that this woman goes back to her village and she shares what has happened to her with the other Samaritans And the other Samaritans make a beeline to Jesus. She went and told the other people about the good news. They make a beeline to Jesus. And they come. And apparently, these people are converted. These Samaritans who worship in the wrong way are converted. And here's why I know that they're converted. Because they say in the text, they tell the lady, we no longer believe because of what you said, but we believe because of what he said. We heard it with our own ears. We saw it with our own eyes. And now we know that he is the Savior of the world. This lady who had just gotten converted sowed the seeds of the gospel 
And from one woman, a village of people, know the Lord. So maybe this year it's your family, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your inner circle, maybe it's the people at your job, whoever it is, God has put you there on purpose to do the work and the will of the Father. But God has given us the antidote to our burnout. Let's pray. Hey, I pray that you were blessed by the message that you just watched. Hey, the gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that the gospel calls for us to respond is through our giving. God gave extravagantly to his people by giving his son. And so we give financially. We give not to get something from God, but we give as a response to what God has already given us, which was life through his son. Hey, why don't you consider partnering with us financially by giving to the work of ministry. Hey, we do so much in our community to be a blessing to those around us. We're not here in the business of taking, but we're in the business of giving what's been given to us. And so, hey, why don't you go on our website, outpouringorlando.com, click on the donate tab, and you can give to the work of the ministry that is being done through the outpouring. Hey, once again, I pray that you've been blessed and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.